Vermont PBS presents the Governor's Press Conference. Governor Peter Shumlin meets the media to address issues of importance in Vermont. Thank you all and thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm proud to sign an executive order today that addresses the challenge we face of folks in Vermont who uh, may have an arrest or conviction record and are unable to get a job because they can't get the first interview. We have a national challenge. Uh, 70 million Americans uh, have been arrested or convicted. So think about that, 700, 70 million Americans out of 350, 360 million people have arrested or convicted records that in many unemployment applications, uh, one of the questions always is, check the box, do you have a, have you been arrested or convicted? We've got 70 million Americans out there who have to check yes. In that case, it makes it very, very difficult to get into the pile of folks who might actually get an interview for a job. In Vermont, we don't have the records of exactly how many folks we have with uh, arrest or convict, convicted records, but we do have, we do know that we release 26 to 2,800 Vermonters from prison every year. So I am proud to join other governors of Virginia, Georgia, Nebraska, and the District of Columbia in signing an executive order that bans the box, that basically says when we hire in the state, the first question will not be whether you've been convicted or arrested. We will hold that question until the interview and give you a chance to qualify for the job for which you've applied. This is incredibly important uh, as we deal with a state that really wants to allow folks, once they've served their time, once justice has been served, to get back into the workforce, to support their families, and to become productive members of society. It really matters uh, because we know that if you're unemployed, your chances of reoffending and going back to prison at $56,000 a year is much more likely than if you are a successful member of Vermont's community. So uh, we're making real progress. And I want to turn it over now to Chris Curtis, who's the co-chair of my Council on Pathways to, uh, for Poverty, to introduce Sherry. Chris. Thank you, Governor. And thank you, members of the legislature and the administration are here today in support of this important executive order. Uh, Vermont Legal Aid has made Ban the Box a priority because in our work, we get thousands of calls every year from low-income Vermonters who are trying to get their lives back on track. They're trying to find affordable housing. They're trying to make sure that they can uh, get their public benefits in a temporary way, unemployment, reach up, many other factors. And I thank you all for being here for this important announcement. I want to thank T.J. Donovan for his help, sitting the county state's attorney, in many of the initiatives that we're take, undertaking. And uh, T.J., we'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks thank for you, being here. Yep, thank you. Good morning. Um, let me first thank Governor Shumlin uh, for continuing to lead the way in reforming our criminal justice system and enhancing our public safety. This executive order is really about a couple things. Number one, it's about level, leveling the playing field, giving people an opportunity who have been marginalized uh, because of our criminal justice system to get back on their feet and get back into mainstream society. Secondly, it's about jobs. And finally, it is about public safety because the best form of public safety is a good job. And folks, as Sherry just spoke about, who have paid their debt back to society, they deserve to be reintegrated into society. So this is about reconciliation. You know, the criminal justice system, uh, frankly, doesn't do a very good job of considering the long-term consequences uh, when you litigate a case in court. Uh, we sign a plea agreement. Uh, oftentimes, we put people on probation. They may go to jail. We offer them, to, uh, we offer them a fine. Uh, but Many times we don't consider uh, what that scarlet letter of that conviction is going to do to folks three, five years, ten years down the road. And folks who are trying to get back on their feet still have to answer that question for a judgment that I'm sure they regret many years ago that they've been branded either disorderly, as Sherry said, or oftentimes a thief. And when you look about, when you look at, and you look at it and you think about it, who's going to hire a thief when you've got to check that box right off the bat? The application's going, going to the side. They're not even getting the interview. So this order is about leveling that playing field, giving folks like Sherry an opportunity to prove 
their worth to prove their mettle to that employer at the time, not to be uh, wiped off the table initially because of a poor judgment they made uh, many years ago. And it's only fair because what the employer gets is really just that box that I'm a convicted thief. What they don't get, what the criminal justice system has, is an affidavit that outlines the facts and circumstances. And oftentimes on these petty thefts, we are talking about such minimal amount of money. This isn't condoning bad acts, but it's putting in perspective and context what's happened because I don't think you'd find a prosecutor or a judge in this state who when they've convicted somebody of petty larceny or retail theft for something valued less than $250, would they ever admit or agree that as part of that punishment, we never wanted this person to work another day in their life. That is inconsistent with public safety. All it takes is a little bit of courage. All it takes is some faith in folks. And I'm just proud of the fact that our Governor Pete Shumlin has that in abundance. Thank you, Governor. Thanks, TJ. Governor Dick Sears. Thank you, Governor, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today uh, supporting this effort to help better reintegrate people into our communities. Um, we have a criminal justice system in Vermont that is beginning to move more towards recognizing there are certain people that we all need to be protected from and recognizing there are certain people that we need to help reintegrate into our communities. The expungement bill is a good example of that. I can remember sitting in a restaurant in Bennington several years ago with a governor and talking to a young lady, well, she wasn't that young, um, who had been arrested as a young lady and was no longer able to take her grandchildren on field trips at the school because of a record. Um, and that led to the first expungement bill in 2012 that the governor signed. And I think this is just a continuation of that effort to recognize the differences between individuals that we need protection from and those that need a helping hand to get back into society and reintegrated. And I thank you for this executive order. Thank you, Senator Sears. So I'm going to sign this executive order, which I'm proud to sign, particularly after the comments that were just made. Sign. We'd be happy to answer questions if you have them. So well, basically, just to sum up, be a judgment call for the hiring manager once they've done the background check at the end of the interview process to say, okay, I, I think this person will or will not reoffend. I mean, is that a judgment call for the manager? I think the judgment call the manager has to make is, this, is, the, is this the right person for the job? That's the first question the manager asks. Then they interview and they try to find the folks who, the candidates, top three or four or five, that's how I always done it, who are the best folk picks for the job. Then, if you find that you're getting down to one or two or three, I usually do a reference check on the folks that I'm zeroing in on. And in that reference check process, you would clearly check criminal record, make sure that it matches what you were told, and make the judgment. Um, there seems to be a difference of opinion between you and the House Speaker and the Senate President over what happens with the exchange if we don't meet that May 31st milestone that you had outlined previously. Um, and when you had made that announcement about the contingency plans, you said then, if in fact we didn't meet either of those milestones, on November 15th, we would recommend a joint fiscal, which of the alternatives we would go to either federally supported state, state Thank exchange, you, you all. <laughs> or just a federal version of the exchange. When you said that then, did you mean that if we didn't have changes of circumstance functionality up and running by May 31st, that it would be your intent to abandon the state version of the exchange and the, make the move to one of those options? I'm focused on getting change of circumstance to work in the end of May and getting re-enrollment to work by the end of October. And my belief is that we're going to accomplish that. So let's not create conflicts that we don't need to have. I'm focused on trying to get the job done. And I know the legislature joins me in wanting the exchange to work. Listen, it's in everyone in Vermont's interest to have a functioning exchange for the simple reason that we all know that going to the federal exchange is not either a financially 
positive option for us or a functionally positive option. So we're focused on getting it done, and that's what I do when I get up in the morning. But you, you said then that Vermonters deserve to know what we're going to do if this thing doesn't if work. If it doesn't work, we are, as I said, if we can't get change of circumstances working or re-enrollment working, it is time to move on. And I made that clear a month ago. But it's an or, like you don't? They've got to both work. But what happens if it doesn't work May 31st? As I said, we believe we're going to have it working on May 31. If we don't, we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. How will the public know if it's working? We're going to tell them. They're going to, they're going to be able to go online and uh, want to make clear what to expect. The change won't happen online, but our folks at Vermont Health Connect will no longer have to use a manual process to change circumstances. That's what we got to get done. Is this a different position than the one that you articulated? No, I don't time? believe it is. That's why I'm confused about all the school. Well, well, so the confusion, I think, stems from the fact that you said if we didn't meet either of those milestones, right. then you would recommend the legislature's joint fiscal office to go either to a federally supported state-based exchange or the federal version of the website. And now you're saying we'll cross that bridge when we get there. My job is to move to the federal exchange if we don't have both functions working, as I said a month ago, uh, by, mid by the end of October. So your intention all along was to judge change of circumstance in October? My intention all along is to get change of circumstance working by May 31, and that's what I'm going to do. But you wouldn't make any sort of determination about it until October? Well, we need both to work, and the other one's not going to work till October, so you can understand why it's a little difficult to, you know. We've come a long way. Optum so far has delivered on everything they've promised. Uh, I want you to give you the good news. Uh, they just delivered a key function three days earlier than they said they were going, and were four days earlier. Uh, I check on this with my team every single day, sometimes three times a day. We all really want this to succeed. So let's focus on what we're doing here. We believe that we're on track. We're optimistic that we're on track. Why are we trying to create a fight over something that we may well not ever have to fight about? Why did you feel like it was important to establish that May 31st deadline? Because I feel like we're all fed up. We're all frustrated. Listen, this has been the most uh, frustrating and disappointing experience of my public life. I've told you a million times that Vermonters and I are fed up. It's incredibly frustrating. So I felt like the public needed to know if this thing still can't, you know, we're still sitting there uh, trying to change circumstances by hand, which is incredibly cumbersome and doesn't work particularly well, as you all know, and creating huge hardship for the Vermonters with the changed circumstances, or if it's not smoothly going to re-enroll re folks in November, it is time to say enough is enough. Now, I'm really hoping we don't have to do that because there is no great option for us, either financially or in terms of functionality. We sometimes forget that we use the money from the federal exchange to re to basically buy the technology that we had to buy on Vermonters' dime otherwise to make the Medicaid system work for us. We have over 100,000 Vermonters on Medicaid. We have literally, you know, a, almost a fifth of our state on Medicaid. We had an antiquated old system that was not going to do what it needed to do. And we were all sitting here as budget writers going, how are we going to rebuild the Medicaid system? So we used this money to do it as well as to make it work for Vermont Health Connect folks. And even if we were to go to the federal exchange, this sometimes gets missed, we'd still have to make this system work for all the Medicaid folks. Now, the reason that the federal exchange doesn't, is not a great option is they're going to charge us, so it will cost us more money. Number two, they cannot deal with the subsidies that we give to lower-income Vermonters that currently get subsidies that are higher than a federal exchange. Number three, the Supreme Court's going to make a pretty significant decision, we believe, in June about whether the federal exchange can even offer subsidies. It would be a disaster for Vermonters if they lost their subsidies. And finally, we have higher insurance standards than the federal exchange, which is a good thing. It protects Vermonters against insurance abuse. So, you know, it would be a real disaster for all of us if the exchange doesn't work, and I'm working really hard to get it to work. Have you articulated what your intentions will be on June 1st in any event? 
change of circumstance? My, my intention on June 1st is to have the exchange doing change of circumstance. So nobody out there knows what's going to happen on June 1st if it's not? We'll cross that bridge if we come to it. Do you know what's going to happen on June 1st if it's not working? <laughs> I'm going to find a high building. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't think the fifth floor is high enough. You'd be left with me. There you go. I can't say as I've ever heard a politician answer a question, i got to find a tall building. Is that, I mean, seriously, that's uh, new territory, is it not? New territory is the frustration I have with Vermont Health Connect. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not old territory. That's why I'm so frustrated. But, you know, this has been incredibly painful. Uh, it has uh, been the most frustrating thing I've ever dealt with. And, you know, I know other governors have gone through it. I get that. Uh, some have had more traumatic experiences than I have. Uh, most have not succeeded much better than we have. But this is tough because it's so important. And the idea of the bill was all good. Uh, the timeline for the technology was not so good. And there's a reason why so many of us are struggling with it. I mean, we sometimes forget the big picture. Vermont is not alone in this fight. Uh, talk to the governors of states like Oregon who gave up and after they spent their $200 million or whatever it was. Uh, talk to, you know, Anya Rader who's dealing with the Rhode Island exchange that she just took over and was told it was in really great shape. Uh, you know, ask her how great it is. Uh, so this is frustrating and it really is an example where Congress and the President passed a bill that finally addressed low-income Americans not being able to get the health care they deserve and the technology dreams didn't match the timeline of the bill. So we're working really hard to do things that technology's never done in health care, not for the private sector, not for the public. It's incredibly frustrating. I won't really jump out of a tall building. Can, can, can you understand, though, why the takeaway for many people from that announcement that you made last month was that now we have a date certain that will trigger a major decision about the future of this thing? And can you understand why uh, I'm being uh, evasive to your question? Let's be honest about this. If it did not work on May 31st, and it worked on June 2nd. Would you move to the federal exchange? Just asking a question. I, that's my question. That's mine too. <laughs> yes. So first. you want more <laughs> flexibility surrounding that deadline? It's a loose I deadline. I don't want flexibility. I want to hit the date. And that's my point. I think we're going to hit the date. So let's work towards that. And if we do, none of this discussion is relevant to anything. Listen, I know we're in the po I know we're in the point of politics, both nationally and in Vermont, where everything's got to be a fight. Everything's got to be, this one said this and this one said that. It's all in our interest to get this thing working. We think we're going to. So give us a chance. But other than persuading Peter of your motives, like, do you still have to persuade the legislature? The only thing that will persuade Vermonters, which is who I care about, is a functioning exchange where they don't go on get divorced, have a baby, or change in circumstance, and find that six or seven months later, nothing's changed. That's what's going to persuade people. But if the Joint Fiscal Committee comes back June 1st and says, OK, time to start pulling the plug. Well then, I mean, realistically, let's talk about that. Let's just say that we all decided on June 1st we were pulling the plug. We couldn't pull the plug until 2018. That's how, sorry, 2017. We couldn't be up and running until 2017. So. You know, for next year, we're stuck with our exchange. I mean, this isn't a race. This isn't you know, like going to the races and betting on a horse, get to the finish line. You know, one win, one doesn't. We're all in this together. We've got to win. And it's a real, it's going to take a lot of time to move the federal exchange. And they can't really do what we want them to do. I had a conversation with, again this morning with Secretary Burwell. They're, they're rooting for us. They're not going, hey, please join the federal exchange. They think we can make this thing work. And they're partnering with us to do it. Were you encouraged to put out this May 31st deadline? I felt like uh, it, was, it was really important that we be clear with Vermonters about what our expectations are. These are our expectations, that the change of circumstances is going to work by May 31st, and that we're going to be able to smoothly do re-enrollment by October. So is your idea October. you weren't asked or encouraged by anyone else? Well, we're all concerned about this. So I mean, this has been a conversation that I've had with legislative leadership, with my team, with Vermonters, uh, 
you know, the point is we have to have a path at this point with all this discouragement and disappointment we've had. We've got to have a path where people know what would happen if it doesn't work. And all I'm saying is if it doesn't work, that's a real disaster for all of us. We're going to make the best of it by going to the federal exchange or some hybrid, but it won't be what we really need, which is a system that can integrate the benefits of the federal bill with the benefits that Vermont currently has, which really help low-income Vermonters, and do it in a smooth and thoughtful way. And Optum has told us that they can do this, and I believe them. So just to be clear, though, it was your team's decision to throw May 31st out there? Yes, it was. What do you think of potentially splitting up AHS? And it still is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> what do you think of potentially splitting up AHS, Agency of Human Services? Uh, it runs counter to everything I'm trying to do. You know, what I want to see is integrated services where silos are broken, broken down in state government. And if you look at Desiree or any of the tragedies we've had, it's been because well, one of the contributing factors has been that agencies, law enforcement, folks who should be communicating with each other don't. So the notion that we build more walls uh, instead of tearing down walls is sort of counter to everything that I'm trying to do here. It was done with, with Health Connect, though. How so? We, we split off um, well, oh, Commissioner Larson's role with, with, right, but, oh, with but, Mr. Miller's when he came on. But he was still under AHS, so the, so the secretary is still in charge of but that. But everyone's still under the governor. Well, let's be clear, though. Vermont Health Connect is asking state government to do an entirely new function that they've never done before, which we can debate the wisdom of, but run an insurance company? You know, run a health insurance company? Let's be honest about this. We kind of, the federal government signed us up for a, a new job. And uh, it is under the Secretary of Human Services. And the Secretary of Human Services oversees that. But this proposal would, would take the medical side and essentially the rest of AHS and, and split it in two. Doesn't, doesn't that allow people to focus and, and can't you yeah. separate elements without constructing walls? I think our job is to take the Agency of Human Services and find ways to integrate with local communities more ably than we have been. To make schools the center of resources, not only for kids but for families. To find ways to tear down the walls that have been built up in government between agencies that create fiefdoms and have rivalries and all the things that happen. And you know, let's go back to Irene. When Irene happened, uh, there were really bad feelings, as an example, between the Agency of Transportation and the Agency of Natural Resources, because they were always, they were in separate buildings, separate places, never talked to each other, and they were always quibbling, fighting over whether something should be built or not, whether they were arrowheads or not, permits being held up, they really were, were at each other. We found in Irene that by putting economic development, transportation, and A&R under one roof, where they have to eat lunch together and get along, uh, they're getting along. I mean, they've actually found out they like each other. So my point is to take and build walls and silos when we're actually succeeding in breaking down walls and silos, I think that's going to serve the public better. And there's just no doubt in my mind that if you look at the most tragic things that we've dealt with in state government, which is the loss of children's lives, had we been less silo-driven, we would have had better success. And vaccinations due to hit the, the Senate tomorrow. Care to weigh in in that debate? Not really. Why isn't your uh, Commissioner of Health on the witness list? I don't know. I didn't know he wasn't. Would you want him to testify on this? He's free to. I mean, I don't tell my secretaries and commissioners when and when not to testify like some other past governors. <laughs> the judiciary everybody. branch. Oh. What's that? Uh, the Judiciary Branch is slated for some budget cuts this year. I just wonder if you supported closing courthouses as a way to find those savings. I've said to the Judiciary, find the money and make the best judgments to find it without hurting due process. So, uh, you know, they, I've talked to the Chief Justice extensively about this. He and I are both concerned because like all areas of state government, we're already under stress. Uh, but I'm going to let them, you know, make the judgment on how best to make achieve those savings. It's not sort of an impossible challenge. Or hasn't he made it clear that you can't continue to cut without an impact on the other end? Sure. It's a matter of choices. You want to make sure that you take the things that you can be most efficient about and implement them and give them the judgment to do that, which they need. And they are a separate branch of government, so I mean, I couldn't do it anyway, to be honest. 
Then the last month, the state clarified its email policy for state employees. Do you use a personal email address or any other personal accounts to conduct state business? Not for state business. I do have a personal email account, but I'm careful to uh, not use it for uh, state business. Was that a, uh, have we had any problem uh, uh, that prompted the change? No, I mean, let's be, you know, I, the, 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 the whole question of this on a national level raised my, all of our sensitivity to this one. And, uh, you know, we got to make sure that we all use state email for state business. And I would ask, I've asked my team to do the same, and I believe they do. Governor, I want to ask one about the underlying insurance offered by Vermont Health Connect. People in their, in their late 20s, I'm told, are, are paying premiums of like 120 a month, 1400 40 bucks a year. And then for uh, insurance that carries a $5,000 deductible, a lot of these folks are making, you know, if they're lucky in the high teens per hour for a wage, uh, they don't have $5,000 in the bank. And, I, and I, you know, I've, I've talked to some who are saying, uh, I'm going to bet that I'm going to spend my $1,400 on my maybe two or three trips to the doctor during the course of the year when I get the flu or something, uh, and just not buy the insurance because it's not a good enough deal. Uh, do you think it's a good enough deal? Well, I mean, that's one reason why the additional subsidies for lower income Vermonters are, are so important and why I'd like Vermont Health Co Connect to work so that we continue to go with those subsidies. But you're, you're dealing, listen, I guess the answer to the question is the goal of the Federal Bill Care Act was to get insurance to folks that couldn't get it in the past. And the fact that we're down to 3.5% uninsured suggests that we're succeeding. Uh, could you always make it fairer? Probably. Uh, is the toughest group to get to sign up for insurance young people who think they're immortal? And, uh, you know, that's always historically been the toughest group to get. Yeah, it is the toughest. But we're making real progress, or we wouldn't have a 3.5% uninsured rate. So, again, with all the stories that we write about the disappointments with Vermont Health Connect, the Affordable Care Act is working for Vermont. It's the reason that our insured rate is so low. If we could just, as we sign people up, actually pay our providers for the promise we're making when we sign someone up, we'd have a pretty improved system. Thank you, team. Watch the Governor's Press Conference each week at this time here on Vermont PBS World. You can also log on and see previous press conferences at our website, vermontpbs.org.